Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 6th of March 2023. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman and well it, it's been a slight disappointment hasn't it? We've, we've had some snow, we had a little bit of peppering up here of snow overnight but but no apocalyptic uh, uh, you know, blizzardy hellscape. I mean, what, <laughs> how are things in London? <laughs> shock horror the british tabloids got a call about the weather entirely wrong <laughs> um, you know i was looking no, forward uh, to uh, snow uh, boots did, fighting did, did, off did, polar did. bears you know that's <laughs> it no uh for, for, for our viewer who's uh, watching outside the uk and particularly our any viewers we've got in the states who have been alternating between record-breaking blizzards and record-breaking temperatures for yeah. uh jan uh, for february and early march mm -hmm. um our, our, our papers have been predicting sort of um, blizzard apocalypse at the yep. beginning of March for the last month or so. Yep. And, of course, the, the time has finally arrived and you've had a peppering of snow up there. My mm. daughter's currently up in Sunderland and there's sort of arrived first thing this morning and they're gone by lunchtime. Yeah. And um, <laughs> d down here we've had a rather pathetic little piss of sleet. Oh, I see. <laughs> like a... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So yes, not not so, not, not exactly. Uh, so having 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 fulfilled completely the national stereotype of the British being obsessed by the weather, yeah. we can now talk about archaeology. We can, we can indeed. Um, although to be fair, we shouldn't, you know, do a Michael Fish here and say it's all fine. Yeah, you know, we we do have snow, uh, you know, uh, forecast for the next few days. We may yet get the day after tomorrow um, trek across the country uh, going. Yeah, they, they, they ended up in the museum, didn't they? They did. Well, shelter. in a library, in a library. They were burning library, books. Yes, yeah. Library, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, as um, as we may find out later in the show, uh, any any Brits face with that um, sort of, with a, with a polar apocalypse uh, <laughs> day after tomorrow's storm, there may not even be a library to go and shelter in. No, exactly. And, not, and they are museums as well. Yeah, they definitely do. Yeah. I see what you were trying to do there, Andy. And I went with it. It's a library, actually. Library. Anyway, anyway, Watching Brief continues. And um, this week, yes, we do have a theme. Uh, we've pulled together a couple of different stories, which we, we described this sort of stuff previously as being canaries down the coal mine. I think increasingly it's becoming more of a cultural uh, issue. It's not any more of a, that is to say, ongoing matter of fact part of the landscape in terms of the relationship between uh, public institutions education and funding uh, but before we get into that we have a few news lines for you to for you to check out if you want to we'll be linking below to these because it, it, it's been a one of the problems last week was that we were trying to pull together an episode and, and i had a a, a slight uh, medical hiccup um on on thursday friday um but also as well we were saying that it feels a little bit like a slightly weird news season for archaeology I and mean, of course yeah this is before the digging seasons got going especially in this country um but there's lots of lots of things but nothing big in that sense so we're going to present here a few articles to to have a look at so i say nothing big but i mean the first one is the news that um a precise characterization of a corridor shaped structure uh, in khufu's pyramid has been observed um by uh, scientific means in egypt well, well in, in this case well, i mean first of all was it built by aliens and secondly were the archaeologists shocked or were they baffled <laughs> well well um uh, and uh, this is something i pointed out on 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 twitter well, i mean sorry first of all no yeah obviously it's not pyramid it's not a pyramid built by alien story um but secondly it's interesting how uh in this instance lots of the news headlines were saying that scientists have found evidence of a previously unknown structure a, a corridor space hall space in the pyramid um, whereas, as you say, more often than not, archaeologists are are baffled. Now, that said, though, should we be even talking about this? Because, I mean, people have um, uh, may or may not be aware that we are under the uh, the directive of um, arse. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the Atlantis Research Suppression Executive. So uh, we, we need to we did. We, I'm sure. I mean, if it's got if it's got to the point of being published in Nature, it's surely passed the mustard with them, hasn't it? Hopefully. Uh, either that or it's disinformation. Oh, I see. It could be a uh, false flag operation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, we need to check with our with our bosses on that one. Um, absolutely. 
<laughs> no, in all seriousness, um, the Scan Pyramids team um, uh, have actually done some really interesting work here, uh, and and have revealed really in what is a, you know, obviously a massive stone structure another uh, potential for um, a humanly accessible space within. And I suppose because I mean we we were joking about this idea of aliens and uh, and or archaeologists being baffled, but it's interesting how when I shared this. Uh, this observation about how scientists, or that we we're called scientists when we discover that you know, something that, that that people can easily sort of comprehend, and we're called archaeologists when uh, when they want to play up the Indiana Jones mystery factor. Um, mm. uh, someone actually commented saying uh, it just shows that archaeologists have been have been bullshitting all along, like somehow we knew, <laughs> and we just yes. weren't we just weren't sharing this truth with the world. And uh, is, this, is this a case of you're damned if you do, damned if you don't? Because one of my favorite things about archaeology and by extension Egyptology is the fact that we are looking for new things. We're looking for new information about the past. But it seems yeah, like if, if, you, if you didn't already know it, you must have been hiding it, you know? Exactly. You know, if the, the database of knowledge remains static, um, mm. the, the sector gets very boring very quickly. Um, you, okay, yeah, you know, part of the time, yes, you do revisit recorded information from yesterday or 10 years ago or 100 mm -hmm. years ago or more, mm -hmm. and you reinterpret it according to new things you found out. But the key thing is, you know, you, 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 you've, you're always looking for new angles, new evidence, and that's what makes archaeology and history so exciting. You, there, there is no static story. There is mm. no one true story. Um, and this is a case of... Uh, a new piece of research has come up with a new piece of uh, a, a new observation and uh, which now has to be, you know, explored, explained. And it adds to the massive knowledge about, you know, well, certainly one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Yeah. Um, one of the wonders of the modern world. Yeah, one of those surviving wonders. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, well, we'll, obviously, we're linking to the, na the Nature paper below. Uh, it's actually mm. uh, titled uh, Precise Characterization, Characterization of Corridor Shape Structure in Khufu's Period pyramid by observation of cosmic ray muons uh, i uh, i shan't go into into that in great detail here obviously we read about it below but also i'll link to a couple of other related stories um in terms of how uh, this question of how it's being reported and how especially how the headlines have been written around this topic because a little bit like stonehenge you say pyramids and people are going to take it take notice aren't they um uh, I think the thing. I think one point. One point I just made very quickly, no. Mark, is, is that this is using uh, a, a very high tech scientific analysis, imaging and analysis technique, mm. which hasn't been um, usual or co common in archaeology that um, before, and no. that's why it's a new finding about the Pyramid of Khufu. Um, yeah, and um, you know, long long may that kind of research continue. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, and also, I suppose on a, on a slightly sort of high uh, sort of theoretical level, <clears throat> in terms of how people talk about archaeology, this sort of um, material, um, uh, in terms of the evidence and 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 how it will lead to this, these sorts of techniques being increasingly used, will also possibly start to answer questions along the lines of the relationship between destructive excavation processes and remote survey. So, um, so it's you know the the, the more tools we have the more yeah. intricately we can actually examine the evidence bef before us. And, and, and I think it's worth making the point there. That's an absolute, that's a, that's a very uh, important point to make. Mm. And, and, and just to reinforce that, I think, uh, again, uh, particular viewers who aren't completely across developments in archaeological techniques and ethics, who just had an interest in history and ancient history or archaeology or uh, whatever, um, may not be aware that there's been a movement Really, certainly in, in in my time being aware of the subject, which is uh, nearly forty years now, mm -hmm. that uh, I'm being involved in, in in the subject at various levels. But that um, there's been a move from destructive excavation to what's uh, often uh, referred to as uh, preservation in situ, mm -hmm. with an increased reliance on remote sensing, so that you own you save the very complex um expensive and completely destructive 
means mm. uh, uh, of excavation for the most important sites or the most threatened sites mm. and only when you've got a really strong justification for actually intervening physically mm. um it's it's very different to the idea that you once had of you know uh, back in the 18th early 19th century of people uh you know grid it and dig it. it grid it and dig it yeah <laughs> just get Exa in there. exactly yeah. the, 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 the 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 early europeans who headed off to uh, belzonian co, so, co who, who headed off to egypt mm. with the idea of yeah recording what they saw but also bring it back for the louvre or the british museum or the pergamum or whatever mm. and, and um it, it you know it, it ceased to have a a reality in the place where it was meant to be yeah it's it's also worth saying as well that, i mean you laid out a couple of of um case studies there i guess another mm. potential would be also deliberately keeping a site that we're likely to know quite a, a lot about using current means of understanding mm. evidence and just leave it for later uh, excavation and in investigative techniques so for example yeah uh, there are, i can think of a couple of roman forts which we are deliberately not excavating because there are other yeah. roman forts i mean vindolanda is ongoing you know you don't need to open up every roman fort now so um yeah interesting it, it, exactly that and, and, and in fact it, a, a few a few shows ago we talked about hms gloucester 1682 hmm. and um that is a wreck that is now being dealt with under the um the rules of the unesco convention on, uh, on the protection of underwater cultural heritage mm -hmm. um and the rules of the unesco convention state that the first choice not the only choice i think we made that point in the program but the first choice when it comes to for example maritime heritage is preservation in situ mm. and then research in situ mm -hmm. and only if a site becomes severely threatened or there's an overridingly uh, overriding benefit from some kind of physical intervention do you move on to you know traditional excavation yeah yeah. Uh, next, we have speaking of traditional excavations and traditional excavation uh, sites and parts of the world. Uh, the I think fairly welcome news. This is on NBCNews.com, uh, the science section, that uh, an ancient restaurant has highlighted Iraq's archaeology renaissance. Uh, the discovery came against the backdrop of a, of a resurgence of archaeology in a country often referred to as the cradle of civilization, but also, of course in more recent years as a, a deeply troubled uh, conflict uh, zone where, um, I mean, probably one of the most infamous uh, raidings of, an in of a national museum occurred in the early 2000s in Baghdad. Um, this is an international archaeological mission uncovering the remnants of what is believed to be a 5,000-year-old restaurant or tavern, um, they say, in the city of Lagash uh, in southern Iraq. Uh, they've discovered an ancient dining hall complete with a rudimentary refrigeration system, hundreds of roughly made clay bowls, and the fossilised remains of overcooked fish. Um, announced in late January by the University of Pennsylvania-led team, ge uh, this generated some buzz beyond Iraq's borders. Now, uh, I mean, obviously, that's a wonderful discovery, but what, how do you feel about it in the context of, of its location, of, of archaeology coming out of Iraq once more? Well, my uh, first thought is, did it get a bad review on the cuneiform version of TripAdvisor? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. fish um, advisor, yes. This fish was overcooked. <laughs> yes. No, look, look I mean, um, well, first, first, thing, you know, first things first, g given the, the, the history, recent history of mm. Iraq, um, the, you know, any archaeology that's going on, um with a you know, with a with a result like this it, you know it's it's a it's a positive mm, yeah um it's uh you know it, it and we know that you know in international bodies including unesco and the british museum some have, have been involved with colleagues in iraq to try and um rebuild the sector really and rebuild the protections and so on that everything that was swept away after the um after the third gulf war Mm. And um, mm. then more recently, the uh, the uh, damage that was done by so-called Islamic State, yeah, uh, Daesh, mm. um, and so yeah, this is this is um, a, 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 an example of the um, of, of Iraq, Iraq and colleagues in Iraq being able to re-enter the world community of archaeology with new research and new sites and so on and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, again it has to be welcomed apart from that it's um, a, a, a wonderful you know, 
archaeology is digging up people archaeology is about rubbish you know this this um this site embodies both those truisms yeah yeah um and well, well, um but, but i mean in terms of people though i think it also embodies this you know we've talked in the past about how um things like uh you know, the uffington horse and the rude man and so on and so forth these things survive because subsequent generations um take them on as their own projects and look after them in their yes. own social and cultural settings and in this instance it looks as though uh, even though this, this the archaeology at this site was actually uh, shut down uh, after 1990 so i think in and around uh, the first gulf war actually and then it just didn't mm. really uh, uh, come back in terms of research um unlike many others they say uh the site was not plundered in the interim this is largely due to yes. the efforts of local people in the area said Zay uh, zaid al rari al rawi sorry uh, an iraq um archaeologist who is uh, also project manager at the site so uh in this instance mm -hmm. it literally says here um would be looters would be run off by local villagers in commas, who considered these sites basically their own property he said uh, and that's that's great because actually there's, I think there's a there's a um, you know that this this is a site manager who is Iraqi Iraqi locals taking ownership and and uh, in terms of preservation of the yeah. site, but also it's interesting how this balances out with stories that we've looked at recently. I uh, say recently in, in the past couple of years, for example, in in Mexico where you have people uh, who there there are discussions over the right of local people to to manage the presentation but they're therefore ultimately the monetization of a site as well um and i think if they want you know if this ends up in a local museum or something and then people can have a sense of ownership that's fantastic but it all yeah. has to start surely to goodness with people local people's decisions about about their heritage this is the thing i mean it goes to the fundamental question about um modern archaeology which mm. is it something we do with people or we do to people yeah um, and finding the right balance within those two extremes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of extremes, we have <laughs> news of uh, a an extreme challenge, a decade-long challenge that occurred and recently came to a close uh, with the headline coming from the BBC, Woman Completes 10-Year National Trust Scone, not Scone, Scone, that's how you say it. And I'm not saying that because it's a north south thing. Apparently I've had it I've had it triple checked. Um it's a scone it's eating. A scone. everyone knows it's a scone. Exactly. Scone eating. I said scone. I'm sorry, scone where did, where did you get this? Yeah, who, who, um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. It's, well, no, if you disagree it, if you if you do if you, if you disagree with us that it's scone and not scone, please reply below the line, as we always ask you to in, you know interact with us below the line. Uh -huh. Um but we reserve the right to completely ignore you completely ignore you because you're wrong. What did and the thing is, are they? Yeah, because the e does make a difference. So, like bone, b o n e. But then again, gone, g o n g o n e. Exactly. So, yeah. Mm. Anyway, ten years. Ten years. National Trust scone eating project. Uh, this is uh, the story of um, Sarah Merka, a forty-nine-year-old from Isleworth, uh, ate the baked goods at two hundred and forty-four sites across England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and ranked every one on her blog. Uh, this is a woman from West London who's just completed a decade-long project to sample a scone at every possible... Can, can I just correct you again? Uh, we, we were talking about pronunciation. Um, for those of us down here in London, I know we're only the capital city, um, but um, it's actually Isleworth. Okay. No, actually, no, no, you're right. You're right. I shouldn't I shouldn't make that face. You're right. Isleworth, <laughs> thank you very much. So, and now, and now is it um, is it Oldwich? Is that another one that's a bit, a bit odd? Oldwich. Oldwich, okay, thank you. Oldwich, yeah. Oldwich, or the old, or the old, the old, the old vicus is that if you want to look at the early English. Well, what, what I mean, what's interesting is whenever I'm down there and I see it on a bus, I always in my silly Welsh head, I go oldil, <laughs> and I'm like, no, that can't be how you say it. <laughs> like, that can't be. It, rem it reminds me of the old Michael uh, Michael Benteen, the goon, who was an RAF intelligence officer during the Second World War, and he served with the Polish squadron, and uh, he famously uh, made made the joke ever afterwards that um that, that not only were they brilliant pilots and brilliant people but they were the first people that he'd ever met who could not only do an eye test but could also pronounce it okay <laughs> yes <laughs> i can see that being a unique a unique experience to, to observe um yeah now uh, she went on to say that this is a very emotional 
experience. It's been it's been weird, she said. It has taken ten, more than 10 years. She shared part of the experience with her husband, Peter, who was diagnosed in cancer in 2016 and died in 2018. So, um, yeah, it's been a... It's been a I mean, bound, it's bound to have been a fascinating experience. It reminds me of, do you remember my friend uh, Lawrence who went round licking every Anglican cathedral? In... Yes, the concrete <laughs> liquor or the, or, or, or the, uh, the limestone liquor or whatever yeah. it's to be made of. Yeah. 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 And the thing, what was interesting about that was that, um, it, 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 you know, uh, uh, most people I bumped into who who you think would be annoyed about it. So, deacons, bishops, this kind of person. If you go to a cathedral, because mm. I, I helped him get to a couple of these places, because we, you know, uh, you have to. The, the logistics were important, and um, most of those people were actually fascinated. They they weren't annoyed. They weren't put off by the notion. They weren't sort of saying this is disrespectful. Um, uh, at uh, Carlisle, I seem to recall someone actually asking him what what tastes better york minster or Car carlisle cathedral uh and he said um he said he had to say york minster because he's from york so uh <laughs> but yeah people have all sorts of weird and wonderful challenges and, and this is one uh well, hitting... i'm just thinking our, our, our good our good friend concrete chris colonco i mean you know, oh yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah now, yeah. <laughs> I won't get into that. He, he, yes, I, 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 I take the mic too often of, of our dear Chris. Um, yeah. Can I, actually, can I just make one point though about um, Sarah Merker's project? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful project. It's one of those really sort of um, quirky little projects that, dare I say, it is perfect sort of uh, weekend uh, news website and. Uh, newspaper fodder hmm. um it, and she's turned it into a blog and she's turned it into a book now what i what, what is missing from the coverage and I, I, i've looked at the coverage in the guardian and also in the um uh, on the bbc news website and we'll be linking to it uh, uh li li linking to it below below the line again uh -huh. um but there is no mention of whether for example there are vegan scones and whether restore trust has complained that vegan scones are woke <laughs> do, do you know what i bet i bet restore trust says scone i bet i bet i bet <laughs> they do i bet you um <laughs> well speaking of wonderful and weird uh this i think is slightly more towards the weird end of the spectrum this is the news um with a fascinating headline that simply we could not drop uh from this section and that is peruvian delivery man carried ancient mummy around in his bag uh, this is, yeah, this is the story of um, uh, of a, uh, a delivery person who, um, who well, it seems, <clears throat> well, it says here, police in Peru made a surprise discovery when they searched a delivery man who came to their attention for acting drunk at an archaeological site in Puno, I'm guessing. Inside his cooler bag was an ancient mummy. The man said that he had been sharing his room with the bandaged mummy and considered it a kind of... Uh, a, a quotes a kind of spiritual girlfriend he had put the remains in his bag to show them off to his friends he said he explained that he kept juanita as he had nicknamed the mummy in a box in his room next to the tv he added that it was owned by his father without specifying precisely how his, it came into his father's possession uh, experts have said that the body was between 600 years old and that it was uh, of an adult male rather than of a, a woman, as the man uh, who was dis discovered with it had presumed it to be. Um, the mummified male is estimated to have been more than 45 years old at the time of his death. And um, uh, it seems that uh, that this this whole story is a bit odd the police have seized the mummy carried it uh, carried in the cooler bag and handed it to peru's ministry of culture uh, which looks for the after the country's heritage the man who was transporting it back to his two friends who are between 23 and 26 years old i'm not surprised were detained and are being investigated for possible yeah. crimes against peru's cultural heritage what 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 do you make of this one because on the what uh, first of all you go it's kind of a cheeky chappy mm. story but it is it is the handling of human remains. It's not a cheeky chappy story. It's about a looter who got caught. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's almost certain. Look, I think th if if, um, uh, if somebody, if, if say for example, I was a, I was a defence lawyer mm. and. I asked my client to explain why they've been arrested drunk at an archaeological site with a piece of with a really important, potentially saleable archaeological artifact in yeah. their backpack. 
Yeah. Um, and they came up with the defence that it was their girlfriend. Mm. Um, and they were carrying it around as a, as a sort of, as a, as a tribute. Um, I'd say good luck with that in front of a judge. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, and it's... Uh, yeah, and they, it, they, they, he's taking yeah. it to his mates to show them his yeah, uh, spiritual look, uh, girlfriend, yeah. Mm. It, it, he's, 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 he's... I get, reading between the lines, this is somebody who got caught banged to rights and was spinning a line and taking the piss. <laughs> and um we well, see you yeah. see so there is an element of cheeky chappy it is there but it's, beca yeah, it's, but it's yeah. because he, it's because he's taking the piss yeah exactly yeah it's yeah. No, it's, it's not look i mean yes people do do have strange relationships with all sorts of things i mean i, I was uh, there was a trailer um on, on the other night uh, um for a channel four series about modern sexuality mm -hmm. and it was highlighting one of the stories that was going to be covered in this was a guy who has uh, a relationship he claims with an avatar on a computer, which he's now because the technology has been improving. He's trying, mm -hmm. uh, which he carries around with him and sort of I, I, I use your imagination, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but which is you know okay, okay fair enough. So as long as you know nobody gets hurt and it's mm -hmm. entirely consensual, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's, there's not a problem. But um, this is uh, th th this is this is uh, this is highlighting really actually the threat of looting to cultural sites in Peru and elsewhere yeah. in Central and South America, where you have a lot of very saleable artifacts. Mm, yeah, yeah, and and as you say, I mean, but I I won I, I no not even I wonder I know I know fine well this is the sort of thing if it had happened here, you'd be getting that sun tabloid headline, wouldn't you? But actually, it would be all about the fact that, yeah, what they were doing was not necessarily uh, kosher. Yeah. Um, next, we come to something much more serious. Uh, and uh, this is something that you uh, dropped into my uh, into my DMs. You slid into my DMs uh, with this link the other day. Um, so uh, it's the, uh, the headline, in Burkina Faso and Mali, uh, there's a pilot scheme uh, that seeks to build defenses against illegal trafficking of cultural antiquities. Um, what's this about? Well, I, I wanted to highlight this because, um, it, uh, you know, when it comes to the threat to cultural, um, cultural heritage and cultural genocide, mm. um, most eyes, most of the time at the moment are on Ukraine mm. and the ongoing, uh, situation in, 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 in Ukraine. Um, and it was, uh, made as a criticism when we first started talking about this, that actually we need to uh, remember that there are other places in the world where culture is under threat. Yeah. And um, we've never pretended otherwise, I hope. Um, no. We've talked about uh, the, the ongoing war in South Yemen, mm -hmm. um, which uh, um, allies of this country, Great Britain, are involved with, i.e. Saudi Arabia, yep. is, is actively intervening on one side of the, of, of, of the, of the civil war. Um, and this is another uh, uh, this is another case though of of a, of a, a region that is uh, politically unstable. Um, there are religious and political and uh, and economic issues, major issues across um, the um, South uh, 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 sub uh, sub uh, sub Saharan Africa, mm. um, and. Not that long ago, we had the first conviction of somebody uh, for a cultural war crime uh, for the destruction of material from the libraries of Timbuktu, the great libraries of Timbuktu. Yeah, yeah. Um, here we're talking about Mali and Burkina Faso, two, two of the countries uh, in, in that region, where a quarter of a million pound, a quarter of a million dollar rather, project uh, from the International Council of Museums and, a, and a, an organisation called uh, ALIF um which is the heritage protection foundation uh they're piloting uh training for staff across 22 museums in the region mm. uh to tr uh, uh, provide training in emergency planning um security of sites and anti-illegal trafficking mm. as mm. well as storage and documentation because obviously you you don't know what you've lost so if you if you haven't got it documented or or, or securely stored yeah. Um, ICOM uh, say they hope it'll be a template for other museums in uh, regions threatened by civil wars. It's the first initiative of its, of its kind, certainly in the area. Mm. Um, and um, I think we can only wish them well and, as they hope that, you know, 
it sounds like a lot of money, but across that, um, it, it, it's actually still a lot, uh, you know, a, a, a pinprick really in terms of what's actually needed. Yeah. But hopefully, it'll uh, demonstrate quite how helpful and important this kind of um, training would be, and that the staff of those museums, if they need to put that training into practice, are also supported by the international organisations like ICOM, like UNESCO, and like national governments. Mm. Well, but also, I, I can't help but think that this sort of planning and just, just an open conversation about, you know, we've seen it happen before, as you say, a place like Timbuktu, it, it may well happen uh, um, in that sort of sub-Saharan um, into uh, West African um, sort of context again. Uh, and crucially, and this, this is where I think it's entirely possible and correct to have conversations that balance uh, the, 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 the requirements of archaeological sites, archives, museums and libraries with the, the, the sanctity of human life. Crucially, having these conversations now and having this training in place now will avoid situations like that of, of Khaled uh, al-Assad, uh, al-Assad, sorry, um, yes. Who, uh, uh, yes. Who was beheaded by uh, ISIS in Syria, wasn't he? In, in around uh, Palmyra. Palmyra. Um, yes. He, he, it, yes. It was. He was. Uh, uh, it's. Um, it's described that he tried to prevent uh, mm. ISIS, uh, ISIS Daesh, so-called Islamic State, finding some of the cultural artifacts, priceless, mm. you know, uh, cultural artifacts from Palmyra, mm. and um, was executed for his pains. Yeah, and uh, you, you know you can't you can't if, if you can't avoid tragedy at, at all at no. all turns, but presumably by having plans in place, maybe um, the the burden can be more um, uh, can be managed in a way that doesn't doesn't fall on on uh, on one person in such a way like that in the future. I mean, the, it's, it's it's kind of hard to know how to talk about it in so much as. The first thing I think when I think of that situation and these sorts of situations is, what would I do? What would what what would what would one do if 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 you know you're in a museum and people come barging in and either want to steal or or, or destroy artifacts because they find them objectionable? Uh, you know, I mean, best case scenario, they want to maybe sell them on. But um, so yeah, so these kind of conversations are crucial, and this this sort of training is is an excellent notion. So thank you for bringing it to my attention. And, and 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 the more so at the moment because uh, I mean it's the article uh, and again we'll we'll link to the article that's describing this in the art newspaper. Um, it points out that uh, just taking Mali as one example, mm. um, the um, the museums range from the National Museum de Mali in in in, in Bamako, the, the the capital, to you know small local, sometimes even family run museums, mm. um, but. Just last November, this country, Britain, withdrew 300 troops who'd been stationed there as a, a combined, well, it, it was principally an anti-jihadist operation. Mm. Um, the French have also had troops posted in the region and they're down, downsizing their, their uh, commitment to the region as well, um, which can only actually uh in all in all likelihood add to the instability and the and the threat to those uh, to those museums mm. uh the governments point out that the the area is unstable Burkina Faso has had um two military uh, coups in just eight months mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ar around um 10 percent of the population have become refugees since that that civil war and um a, a, a jihadist insurgency was launched in that country mm. Mm. so you know this, this is one of the most uh, unstable and difficult areas of, of, of the world but um i think it, it, it's a you know a positive that that culture uh, much of which is of you know international importance mm. isn't abandoned yeah yeah well and that there's a plan in place yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. well uh closer to home we have a story here that's building up to our our main course in so much as it's about uh this relationship between museums and, and accession of artifacts, but also the types of material that, that we're finding all the time as archaeologists. Uh, and this is the story of an incredibly rare ancient comb made from human skull. Uh, it was identified among thousands of artifacts, thousands, I'll, I'll reiterate that, of artifacts, are recovered during archaeological excavations uh, as part of the A14 improvement scheme. Uh, this is uh, near to Cambridge, 
Um, and uh, uh, this is actually, well, just to, to be more specific, this is among 280,000 artifacts. Um, now, interestingly, this, uh, this particular piece, while it is dis being described as a comb, it's made out of human skull, um, they can't be certain researchers can't be certain uh, that it was actually used for, for example, combing. In fact, almost certainly wasn't. Um, it could be used for scribing of some sort of scrying or something, some sort of scratching, mark-making practice. Um, it does shine new light, they say, though, on ritual belief in Iron Age Britain, pre-Roman Britain, uh, including how human remains were looked uh, upon after and sometimes modified. Um, looked upon, sorry, looked after and sometimes modified within local communities, uh, presumably for ritual purposes. Now, now this is this is also one of those things where uh, uh, I, I'm 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 even quicker these days to say no. Archaeologists don't just call something ritual because they don't know what it is. Uh, you know, there is actually yeah, there are there are other ways of describing things you don't know what they are. Um, and actually, the, a good example of this is. Um, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago where human remains that had been modified were specifically described as not being um, ritualistic. It was actually much more likely to be a medical uh, intervention of some mm. sort. So so we can tell. And in this instance, I think it's quite reasonable to say we don't know. <laughs> and therefore, it could possibly be ritual. Um, uh, to be able to see such hyper-local influence, as they say, in terms of groups of people living over 2,000 years ago is astonishing. It's possible that it was carved from the skull of an important member of an Iron Age society uh, or a local group whose presence was in some way preserved and commemorated through their very bones. Which is, you know, I mean, the Catholic Church uh, still holds um, reliquaries to be sacred, don't they? This is a, a long-lived practice. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting. I mean, it, 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 credit where it's due. It was discovered by archaeologists um, from uh, the uh, Museum of Archaeology, uh, Museum of London Archaeology, MOLA, one of the MOLA. biggest yep. uh, the contracting units in the country. Um, it was found as part of a um, pre-construction uh, uh, developer-funded excavation along the line of the A14. Um, mm -hmm. in a two-year program so mm -hmm. it's um uh it's one part of a um, of a much larger and a very small part it fits in the palm of your hand actually if you look at the uh the the illustrations yeah. um uh, it's one part of a very much larger picture and uh hopefully the uh the the, the full reporting of the of the excavation work will give some more contact to what is actually just the report of an object at the moment yeah um what, what, what do you make but, of uh sorry because towards the end of the story dr steve sherlock um hmm. of mola I, I take it um said that hmm. uh that this is further example of the spectacular results from excavations for the a14 improvements adding detail in, and insight into our understanding of the human ac of human activity across cambridgeshire and beyond is this an argument for civil engineering as a sampling strategy i'm asking that obviously no. in the context of, of studies yeah. and so on and so forth no, no. um civil engineering is not a sampling strategy because archaeology goes where the civil engineers want us to go yeah or, mm. or no 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 where, where the civil engineers go archaeologists follow because that's the current planning rules i should mm. say i will follow you uh them's them them's the rules uh-huh um so for example uh one of the criticisms has been that for example on a pipeline survey take a very specific example mm -hmm. you get a you might get a detailed geophysical transect of the piece of landscape um that the pipeline is going through but that might be only tens of meters wide yeah and where you don't uh, where you don't find something on the landscape there's no digging but what you don't uh, but what uh, doesn't get recognised is uh, because the developer isn't paying for it mm. is the you know Romano British rural settlement that's a few metres away from the edge of the uh, you know the, the bounds of the development site. Um, so, as a sampling strategy, it's not a designed one; it's an accidental one. Yeah, that doesn't mean though that you don't it, that the, the developer-funded archaeology doesn't produce really valuable information. No, and mm. um, in particular in this case um the you know a, a particular cultural detail about life 
in that particular area at that particular period. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, um, Dr. Sherlock talks about uh, details and insight and understanding of the human activity across Cambridge and beyond. That presupposes that somebody is doing the synthetic research to look at activity, not just on that site and its immediate environs, but across, but, but more regionally and actually even nationally when you're dealing with cultural stuff like, for example, the handling of human remains, whether you can spot regionality, for example, within the handling of human remains, mm, you know, that kind mm, of thing. Or the modification of them in this, in this case. Um, okay, and that's it. Just, just, just to clarify then, that, that, I think that's a really interesting and crucial point that you make. Um, <laughs> God, it sounds as though you don't normally make interesting and crucial points. Um, no, actually, actually, that's worthwhile saying, Andy. Uh, we're not listening to. Um, no, no, but just to be clear, is that this idea that 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 if you are sam if you see uh, Cambridgeshire in this instance as as a field, and you want to to sample that field in order to um, maybe hone in on human activity, or even you know where the human activity is, and you want to sample. Uh, parts of it by cutting transepts or test pits or whatever uh, it's not a good idea to bring in a civil engineer to to focus your search for human activity because that's not what the, that's not what they're there for that's not what they're doing just because they happen to find stuff in the ground is kind of inevitable and therefore it becomes an archaeological uh, adjacent process but it's not an archaeological sampling strategy because it because it, it's it's essentially unrelated to to historic human activity, and uh, and anything it will find uh, will be will be simply fortuitous as opposed to actually the result of of a, of a proper sampling approach. Exactly, and, and in fact, if if, if uh, viewers want to look online and look up uh, I mean, keywords like regional uh, regional research strategy, uh, regional archaeological research strategy, mm -hmm. you'll find that many parts of the country. Um, but, uh, but many parts of the country have uh, research strategies that archaeologists have put together, usually with the assistance of organisations like Historic England and mm. uh, the Royal Commission in Scotland and, and so on, um, uh, to try and place developer-funded work within a wider research brief. Because as long as, I mean, going right back to the early days of PPG 16, and when I first started um, studying archaeology in the early 90s, PPG 16 was very new. Um, and uh certainly in london there was a move very soon very soon to understand that this was going to produce a lot of new archaeological data by making developers fund archaeology on sites that they were going to build on and destroy mm -hmm. but this data would be floating around out of context unless it was put in a specific regional context with research questions identified, maybe even prioritised. Mm, mm. um, so that, for example, you could then link in with universities and people looking for PhD subjects, for example, could look at, yeah. uh, say, for example, the handling of uh, uh, the cultural, uh, the cultural uh, presence of human remains in Iron Age Cambridgeshire. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That yeah. would be an example of how a research strategy might work and employ this kind of artifact. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. A watching brief is a formal programme of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst, and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared, and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. So you're absolutely right. We, you, you need to have a strategy when it comes to not only sampling a site and understanding uh, how people were living there and focusing your research if that's why you're there, but regardless of whether it's an archaeological excavation or the result of a civil engineering project, material found has to have an organized and structured place to go. Otherwise, it just floats around and people can't join up the dots and the, and, and the, the data um, the data uh, and the potential of that data is lost. Uh, and that leads us into uh, a story that, that kicks off, I suppose, with this headline from BBC News, that England's archaeology hist archaeological history gathers dust as museums fill up. 
Um, this is uh, based on a report from Historic England that uh, is suggesting that museums could soon run out of. And to be fair, they've been they've been very close to running out of room for a while now. But anyway, could soon run out of room for such artifacts as uh, the, the report here talks about Roman um, uh, pottery and Bronze Age you know, uh, metallurgy and this kind of thing. Um, could soon run out of material for that sort of uh, space for that sort of material. Um, and this was uh, actually a report commissioned uh, by the Arts Council England showing that unless they acquire more storage space, the amount of material coming out of the ground will soon be greater than the space available to store it. The clock is ticking, they say. Now, obviously that's storage, uh, uh, but also as well, I guess there's this question here of, of understanding the material coming into archives as well. Uh, I know that, that here in the Northeast, um, I won't name any particular... <laughs> Any particular, it could be anywhere in the northeast of England. Um, there are uh, there are archives which are absolutely full of material um, for which there's no money to go and check what it is. So there's stuff in rooms that we that that uh, when a P as you as you were saying before the the wee break there when a PhD does come up, you know potentially you can direct a PhD at material in a certain section of a storeroom or an archive. Mm. Um, but this is this is an issue of just having the space to begin with. I mean, what, where 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 do you where where do you begin and end on this sort of topic? Is it just about money, just getting brick more bricks and mortar? Uh, in, in short, yes, hmm. because uh, archaeological archives have always been about storing them. Hmm. Now, um, again, anecdote isn't evidence, but for example, um, when I started, uh, when I first qualified in archaeology, one of my first jobs was volunteering at the um, then um, Borough Museum uh, for the Borough of Greenwich in mm -hmm. Plumstead. And one of the jobs I had was uh, cataloguing archive. And one of the things I was cataloguing um, and reboxing was uh, material from the excavation of Lessness Abbey that took place before the First World War. Hmm. Um, and it was checking that the what was then a, a card index um, was actually accurate that did actually report all the things that were in the archive boxes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the descriptions were correct mm. and then they were being entered onto a, a digital database mm. and you can extrapolate that, that that excavation was carried out by the local archaeological society Mm -hmm. um, and um, a couple of leading um, archaeological experts, antiquarian, uh, generally speaking, the antiquarian end of the of the spectrum. W. T. Vincent uh, mm -hmm. being one, uh, who's big name in in Southeast London archaeology mm. uh, in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. But that you can extrapolate that across the whole country. Um, that you know. Uh, museum collections were built up piecemeal by donations by local archaeological societies um and 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 so on um throughout the 19th and and, and 20th century through to really roughly the 1970s early 1980s mm -hmm. um by that time you've got professional archaeological um groups coming on stream doing the early versions of developer led work shall we say not always developer funded but, but what, what's called rescue archaeology there's the famous uh, penguin uh, blue cover paperback called rescue archaeology philip ratz wrote mm. um that material was then needed to find archive um in uh in london we had the uh, the groups that led to uh, the precursors to mola museum of london archaeology mm -hmm. um some of them connected with the local boroughs some of them connected with the what was then uh, the Guildhall Museum of London, uh, one director of which was Mortimer Wheeler in the nineteen thirties. Um, right. So um, late nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties. So you, you, you um, and and there was a, a, a vast amount of material. Now, I mean, again, London's a special case, obviously, because it's the capital. Uh, it has been the capital since um, very early in the Roman occupation, um, and the amount of development work meant there was also a lot of archaeology for example uh the museum of london collection has lots of material that was found when the london underground system was built by cut, often by cut and cover tunnel methods which land through uh particularly famously um, roman sites roman mosaics and so on um that were discovered during the building of the london underground 
Again, see previous um, for a relationship between sampling strategy and civil engineering. <laughs> absolutely. Um, now, just to give you an example, um, the the, um, the London Archaeological Archive was the answer to this. Now, it opened in the late 1990s mm -hmm. um, at um, a place called Mortimer Wheeler House in Eagle Wharf Road in Hackney. Um, and it's basically, it's a warehouse where which can act as a central repository and crucially um study base hmm. for the material archives from london excavations now when it was set up um the um they were uh we'll put it this way uh, the figures published at the time um they had 1400 separate archives for sites that have been examined in london just since 1991 that's right. you know, within around 10 years, mm. less than 10 years, 1400 sites. Now, some of those have been watching briefs, mm -hmm. um, but they were also, that was 1400 archives, but there were 25 separate archaeological organizations that had created those archives. Some of them had actually gone out of business. Mm -hmm. um, the Newham Archaeological Unit, run by the London Borough of, Unit, uh, of Newham, was cut in a, an earlier round of council cuts and its archive was left floating until it was taken over mm. um famously the archive uh, the early digital archive from newham was unreadable because it was on software that was obsolete okay. um, yeah. and by october 1998 uh, the london archaeological archive contained something like 150,000 registered finds Mm. Yeah. That's uh, 120,000 boxes, 75 tons of architectural stonework, mm -hmm. 4,000 environmental samples, mm -hmm. and, and shelving of around 300 metres of paper records. Yeah. Now extrapolate that across the country, and you'll see the scale of the of the problem that storage represents. Absolutely. Now. Now, London, because at the time, it, again, it was it, it was able to work as a single region, as a county, effectively. Mm. Uh, it was able to take the decision to create a single central archive. Other places haven't done that. No. And you have this patchwork as well of local authorities, um, you know, from the parish up to the county with mm -hmm. variations in between. And so there is no one model for the who'd be responsible. Is this, is and this, that's the, is it, sorry, is, is, is this partly as a result of archaeology's roots in, in essentially an amateur, amateur hobby, as it were, um, that where, as it became more and more formalized, that actually curios would be, yeah, would become local museums. All, and, all, all those, all, yeah, all those, um, all, all those areas will have local museums with local archives many of which will contain archaeological material going back into the 18th century and sometimes even earlier. Mm. Certainly, but particularly the 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you another example. Canterbury, where I grew up, the local museum um, was called the Beanie Institute. And it was called the Beanie Institute because it was the endowment of a Victorian doctor and yeah. one of the local great and good yeah. who'd endowed it for the public good. Mm. Mm. Um, and it housed a library and a museum upstairs. So, and when you say archaeological um, material from the 17th, you mean archaeological material that's been generated, i.e., recovered in the 17th century, not that it's that it's that yeah. old. So it could be yeah, prehistoric. You, you, it's just, you, know, yeah. you, you know, from 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 the collections, for example, the you know early, early antiquarian collections, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, people who you know early barrow excavators who might yeah. collect stuff and then present it to the, you know, it might be presented to the local museum, or they might endow the local museum. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and so you, you you get sometimes material that's you know it's nationally important or certainly mm -hmm. regionally important mm -hmm. um but there's this sort of slightly flaky structure around which um archiving takes place what's also important to remember here is that in the early days of the coalition government under the Os uh, osborne austerity plans a lot of government um what called quangos uh were got rid of one of which was the one that dealt with museums, libraries, and archives, and it was subsumed into the Arts Council, right. which is why the current report is a, is a joint production between the Arts Council 
and Historic England. Historic England, obviously being the archaeological regulator and the government's archaeological advisor, the Arts Council basically doles out the money to museums, mm, mm. Um, put very, um, at least nationally funded museums, what's called mm. the, the National Portfolio. Um, now, leave, that leaves out local museums that are funded entirely by local authorities. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are funded jointly, but um, it, it, it's, it, it points to the complication of trying to deal with this whole issue because there's no single national system. Um, so, as I was saying, you know, London, you can deal with this regionally with the London Metropolitan, you know, we have a London Metropolitan uh, paper archive, mm -hmm. uh, document archive, and we also have the London Archaeological Archive mm -hmm. run across the whole region, representing mm -hmm. the, the whole region. Mm -hmm. um, other areas aren't so, aren't so lucky. And what this latest report is, 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 as I say, is an attempt to move things on from, in fact, the most recent um, report that um, came out in 2018. Um, that was a report, um, there was a report called the Mendoza Review, which looked at uh, museums and, and and archives and made recommendations and historic england responded to that with a whole series of um recommendations that they submitted to the dcms department of culture media and sport which is the you know as I said, it's the government department that's responsible for all this um and um it talked about the uh it made, the recommendations included um DCMS, Arts Council England, um, the Heritage Lottery Fund, mm -hmm. and also uh, where relevant national museums like the British Museum or Museum of Wales in Cardiff um, should take the lead in ensuring that the issue of archaeological archives is addressed. Um, and uh, and how, how, uh, how do they do that? Do you think they're going to be lobbying upwards to government for more money? Because basically it comes down to money. If you want more buildings, you want to be able to employ it, more That's archaeologists, exactly what it comes so down to. Money. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, yes, it, it, it's dressed up. In, the recommendations are dressed up in lots of, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a lot of, um, you know, it looks for um, uh, effective governance models. It talks about developing regional capacity. Mm -hmm. Um alongside or close to a major out of London national museum store, such as the science museum stores at Roughton or the planned new British museum store at Reading. Again, this is the thing people don't uh, often don't realize when you go to South Kensington and go to the science museum. Mm. Um, yeah. They've got airplanes hanging from the ceiling and things like that. They've got a heck of a lot more out in their, in, in, in their stores at Roughton. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, which aren't normally open to the public. No. Um, they're there as, an archive of nationally important scientific material, mm. uh, but just the stuff that isn't available. It, you know, it, it, it's like the, the, you know, mu museums operate on the iceberg principle is that, you know, there's the point that's above the water that the public sees. And then there's everything else that is sometimes in the overflowing archives that some of it's not even been accessioned and catalogued, mm. you know? Well, uh, um, and this is, I mean, this is, uh, this is something that we've included a link below uh, that was highlighted on the 1st of March where Mork, York, I said Mork, <laughs> Mork mu Museums, Mork, oh my goodness, York Museums Trust uh, is facing financial problems and says that, that, that things aren't sustainable as they are. So that, that was mm. a, very, a public declaration of that in, in the York press. Um, but we've also linked to uh, uh, this, this idea of an iceberg is interesting when you consider a story uh, from, muse from the museums association.org website um, that the, there was this sort of idea being floated uh, in late December, apparently um, closure by stealth, the shock, uh, uh, the, the, the shock has been described over uh, a plan to turn museum of Cardiff into a mobile attraction. Now is it, is is it is it is, is does does this problem require and and uh and you know necessitate these sorts of innovative solutions is this a way of of having the iceberg being able to roll and tumble and be a bit more um dynamic in terms of what it's presenting to the public how and where or uh or or or, or not okay um 
being optimistic, you might say that the idea of a mo creating a mobile museum that can reach hard to reach audiences mm -hmm. is an absolute good for the people of Cardiff. Yeah. Um, you might also say it's the council trying to save a quarter of a million quid a year mm -hmm. when its budget is under pressure. Yeah. Um, basically, what what happened was Cardiff Council floated a number of kites ahead of uh, creating its 2023-2024 budget. Mm. Um, uh, one of which was um, uh, uh, putting out to private management uh, the um, one of its major concert halls. Mm -hmm. The other one was to close the Cardiff story it held, uh, which is housed in a, um, a again a very important uh, library building. Uh, in central Cardiff. Um, the idea was that the building would be closed uh, and the collections would be uh, sent out on the road effectively with um, uh, curated by fewer staff. Mm. That was going to save about a quarter of a million quid. Mm. Uh, there was a, as might be expected, um, and maybe was art wanted because the council might have been looking for cover to make a decision one way or the other. Mm hmm um they there was a there was a a, a a backlash against the proposal um the uh, there was a very vociferous um residence based campaign against the cut although the council claimed that um of uh, residents polled 57.1 percent supported the closure and mobile museum plan okay um it was absolutely not supported by the Museums Association, the Federation of Museums and Art Galleries of Wales, uh, and others. And as I say, there was a vociferous campaign. Um, one of the um, point persons on that was Professor Jane Henderson, who's a conservation professor in, uh, uh, I think it's the uh, university, uh, Cardiff University, uh, if I'm rightly. Um, but um, who um, was very active on social media in... Uh, opposing and, 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 and promoting uh, petitions and so on. Mm. Um, now, cut to the chase. The council has withdrawn that particular plan for now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the museum, uh, the Cardiff story remains open at the old library building. Um, but it's still potentially under threat because they're going to be reviewing their budgets going down the line. Mm. And we can, I think we can only expect more of that. Now, again, a couple of weeks time, we've got the, um, the, the, the budget, uh, with Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, mm -hmm. um, that will, um, be, Hunt. um, Jeremy Hunt. Yes. Hunt, Hunt, Hunt. Jeremy Hunt, uh, <laughs> who, um, who'll, who'll, be, who'll be giving the, um, uh, the, the good news and bad about what, departments are going to be able to spend yeah. in the next financial year and going forward yeah. um the uh, yeah we will we'll see um obviously again it's complicated by the fact that um museums um are uh devolved to local authorities and to the local um regional lo local assemblies as well so for example um welsh budgets are set by the senate largely set by the senate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and uh you know basically we'll we'll wait and see po po you know politicians set budgets according to their priorities yeah now going back to that um that that um review um by by historic england um one of the things it said about archives was that the DCMS should recommend to uh, should recommend to museums that they should consider charging for the deposition and curation of archaeological archives where they're created as part of the planning process. That is an absolute uh, application of the polluter pays principle. Yeah, um, that under underpins all uh, all developer funded archaeology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But of course. That is currently in question um, because of the government's um, that plans to remove quotes red tape that have never been taken entirely off the table. No. And just this week, the retained EU law bill, which potentially could remove all EU, EU environmental protection, 
mm. um, all, all environmental protections derived from EU law from the English law book or, or the, the United Kingdom's law book by the end of this year was being debated in the House of Lords. Yeah. Um, so you've got a lot of, again, like all these things, it's complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. But as you say, quite rightly, in the end, it comes down to money. If we're going to have regional and national uh, archives, repositories, they're going to have to be funded by somebody. Local authorities, uh, for local authorities, it will be a discretionary spend, mm -hmm. um, by and large, mm -hmm. which means that the funding is going to have to come from uh, national bodies. So, for example, the, the government gives extra grant to Historic England to administer this and mm -hmm. arrange this. Um, or the British Museum or whatever. You know, the British Museum is already funded to run the Portable Antiquities Scheme, so it could be you know, funded to administer r National Archaeological Archives, for example. I'm not saying that's a plan. I'm just saying that's hypothetical. Yeah. That's how it might be done. Is, uh, is, is and past... It's part of the problem here <clears throat> um, that so many local museums and archives, especially if they're responsible for, for a, 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 you know, bigger than a city, smaller than the county kind of regional mm. material, um, that lots of these are housed in great big old legacy buildings. So, for example, the Cardiff story is absolutely in a building which is quite grandiose, but also I imagine um, not terribly energy efficient. Uh, and probably has extremely high heating and lighting bills, et cetera, et cetera. Also maintenance bills. Um, you know, thinking about about uh, museums like, for example, here in, in Newcastle, we have a wonderful legacy mm. museum that used to be known as the, as the Hancock, uh, the Museum of the North. Um, mm. yeah. uh, again, it's a great big old building, stone, marble, uh, you know, wooden paneling, all this kind of stuff. But that comes with its own costs ahead of um you know in that sense you need to have the space in which to, to actually house this material yeah. and then therefore inevitably that material and its accession and and, and um, understanding of that material gets pushed down the list i suppose because I, I imagine on the thumbnail for this video i'm probably gonna have something like you know uh <laughs> can we afford not to pay for this um but in that sense uh it's it, it feels though you know society makes choices, and yeah. and since since uh, Britain um, has left or you know left its imperial ambitions uh, increasingly aside over the course of the twentieth into the twenty first century, uh, it nonetheless feels as though there's this 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 decision this desire to to maintain some of these luxurious. Um, structures that speak of these international power connections uh, and, and how they relate to regions and, and that trickles down into oh we need to have a very fine museum for our area and so on and so forth um, is it a matter of, of, of someone somewhere who holds purse strings realising that, you, that you, you cannot have your cake and eat it you know you, you can't have a museum and not pay for it yeah yeah um... In a sense, look, legacy museums like the Museum of the North weren't, you know, they were created in a world where developer funded archaeology didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and the, and the, the money the, came you know, from, you, you, from you, as you say, the great and the good, like like the Beanie example. That yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you weren't getting, you know, tens, dozens, hundreds of archive boxes a year from the local developer funded work. No. Mm. Um, not, not to mention all the paper records and the digital records and so on that go with it. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, there's going to be a horror. I, I, I think you know, uh, I, C Cambridgeshire, for example, is using uh, Deep Store, which is a former salt mine in Cheshire, mm -hmm. um, where they're storing at least part of their archival collection. Um, and yeah, but that, that, and that, that's one potential solution. There are commercial store storage um, uh, storage companies that that can provide that kind of service, but they can't provide it for everybody. No. And there remains the access that you know, if somebody's wanting to 
um, do research in Cambridgeshire, should they have to go to Cheshire and then and, and order something up out of a, a store? What's the lead time on the, you know, there, there are all, all sorts of access issues around that kind of solution because mm. that you know, commercial stores aren't designed for quick access for scholars. No, they're designed to store stuff, stuff safely at yeah. a reasonable cost. Mm. You know, so do you then have to employ curators at a place like that to service the, uh, the scholars and, and what's the demand for the scholarship uh, from uh, from scholarship for for those particular archives? Mm -hmm. um, are there archives that are particularly in demand that maybe should be located somewhere else? You, you, the moment you start thinking about it, it you know you, your mind ties itself up in knots. Mm -hmm. um, the old, well, you know the simple mm -hmm. solution is like a uh, forget regionality. And we go for an overall national archive of archaeology at a reasonably accessible place, maybe in the Midlands, maybe on the M4 corridor, whatever, like the Science Museum stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you, you create something like that with a very effective digital portal for uh, access for the most, you know, most popular, particularly documentary resources. Or increasingly, you know, we've got with the ability to 3D scan and uh, create 3D models for computers. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who don't necessarily need to handle stuff no. in physically, mm -hmm. you can uh, you, you you can see a, a, the potential in something like that. But somebody in the end has to pay for it. Um, you know, the logic at the moment, with the law as it is, is that the bulk of the money should come from the developers whose profits, uh, who, who who enjoy the profits of the work that generates these archives in the first place. And that you know that they they should be funding not just the work but all the subsequent work and storage as well. You know, as as part of their payoff to society for um, you know the the impact on the environment that they created. Yeah, but but, but, but whether, that, go on. So, but, well, yeah, but the, but that's not that's a solution maybe for the curatorship of a, of a particular archive or part of an archive. Mm. That is to say, sorry. An archive um, that's attached to a site, as opposed to the archive in which that archive is stored, if so to mean. But that also that doesn't though pay for uh, a lifelong curatorship. It doesn't pay for people to to look after the place, does it? No, but if you put a levy on developers um, who are subject to the police place principle for the historic environment as well as the natural environment, anyway. Mm. A levy on you know every developer, uh, every every planning application that um, you know is uh, is granted um, would go a long way to supporting something like this. And then you add in you know heritage lottery and that kind of uh, you know and, and other trusts and foundations and so on who might want to contribute to something like this. Uh, I mean, basically, what we have at the moment is a bodge, hmm. um, and it's a uh, it's a bodge that will become increasingly unstable as work continues. But if we don't sort out the bodge and, and do it properly, or at the very least come up with a more sustainable bodge, then at some point the system's going to fail. Um, then you know, what's the point of doing archaeology? Is there? I'm just going to have a, a final little uh, devil's advocate jab here at you. Um, is there a an argument here therefore for having uh for returning to conversations around community curatorship of material um so at it, you know this could take a couple of different forms one form is that we stop banging on about metal detectorists and just let them uh keep material that they find as long as it's recorded in some fashion and uh and you know sale can be negotiated at a later date if they want to, to take it to a, a, a you know um to an, an auction house uh another a, a, a less sort of interpersonal um relationship between the artifact and quote-unquote ownership in terms of discovery in that sense i guess would be schools for example or even individual households almost having a bit like jury duty but it's jury duty for for looking after something so maybe a small collection of uh clay pipes is housed in class 1b at the local primary school for 
for six months or a year, and then it moves on maybe up through the classes or moves on to a different a different um, site. Is is there something in that? In so much as we've just been, you know, I think it's admirable that Cardiff. You know, apart from the fact that clearly it was it was just to save money, um, it's admirable that that a solution was being discussed that was somewhat innovative. This idea of a mobile museum it doesn't solve archiving, it doesn't solve long term storage, it doesn't to solve specialist storage of material either, uh, and neither, I suppose, with this sort of you know museum in the community notion that. I've heard pe- different people talk about it in different ways. That's why I present the metal detecting scenario. It's why I presented the school uh, school scenario, for example. But do you think we're going to have to fundamentally break down what these great big legacy structures are and and reconfigure them in some way? I mean, that, I guess that's more or less what you've just been saying. But I guess is there a way to do it that that's that's going to work? That's not just like a better bodge, but also isn't just um, I don't know, somehow anarchic and and ultimately results in material either being lost or data worse still being, uh, you know, inscrutable. Okay. Um, I'm all in favour of working with communities, not doing things to communities, right? That's, mm-hmm. you know, it's a fundamental modern archaeological practice mm. that we share, that we talk, that we discuss, that we listen and we make, and, and, and that we do our level best to make things available mm. to the people who care, whether that's a PhD student, an experienced academic, or class 1B, mm. right? That's mm-hmm. absolutely central to what we do. Otherwise, there's not, you know, there's no point. We, we, we're just doing it for ourselves, and that's just self indulgent. Mm. Yeah. Um, but to even to, to, to do that light touch, you still have to administer it. Mm. It still has to be somewhere when class 1B isn't looking after it. Mm. It still has to be catalogued so that you know that class 1B's got it. Yeah, yeah. And what happens to that 75 tonnes of architectural stonework that the Museum of London Archaeological Archive took on in 1998? Because mm. your local class, you know, class 1B aren't going to look after a Gothic arch from the local abbey. <laughs> No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And it would be weird if it turned up in in your grandparents' garden, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. It, it, exactly. The yeah. metal detecting example we talked about it a couple of shows ago. That the, the uh, that works if you have compulsory recording, mm. which has to be paid for. Mm. You have to have the people to, uh, to to. You have to have the extra finds liaison officers to make the records to enter them into the database and so on and so on. Well, and also never mind. There there, there is no cost free solution to this. That's the problem for for politicians. Yeah. Anything, any, any solution will cost. Mm. Uh, Well, but also in that instance, never mind just the recording of the material, but also you have to have people who are monitoring to make sure that material is in fact being reported as opposed to just turning up in, in, uh, on, um, as you put it, yeah. Evil Bay, um, a little while ago. Um, other, other, other auction platforms are available, <laughs> just as despicable in terms of how they allow <laughs> antiquities to be sold without provenance. Anyway, sorry. Um, I'm just imagining you having some weird, like, dungeon where you just, you know, you take auction platforms to to, to, to tell you what, how, what a bad boy they've been. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, do you don't have a cellar, do you, in that in that house? Oh I, yeah, I, I have a special evil bay gimp mask. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> okay, well, we are going to keep that in the in the edit, but goodness me. Um, okay, so uh, so <laughs> I'm joking, reviewer. I am joking. <laughs> Indeed, no, it's for Amazon, isn't it? And um, yeah. um, <laughs> for, oh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, so this has been uh, a watching brief, and uh, I think it's an it is an ongoing conversation. It's one that, uh, well. That we're we're going to have to see some sort of solution to in 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 the not too distant future because as you say otherwise the dam is likely to bu- be to to burst. We've talked about as I said previously, canaries down the coal mine for a while now, and and um, at some point we're going to have to listen to the canary and and, and create a fundamentally better um, structure. I'll give you an example from the nineteen nineties when the Dockland London Dockland was being redeveloped. Mm-hmm. Uh, colleague of mine at the time. Uh, this is what happens when you don't have a system for uh, 
collecting and curating archives. Mm. Um, one of the Victorian warehouses near to London Bridge Station was being cleared. There's a skip in the street. And at the top of the skip were uh, folios and folios of Victorian minute books and architectural plans. Yeah. Mm. They were just being chucked. Mm. Yeah. Because there was nowhere to put them. Nobody, no. nobody valued them. There was nowhere to keep them. Well, actually, on a similar note, didn't something similar happen to plans for, uh, was it the Flying Scotsman in York? There was material that it, was chucked out of an office, and um, it, it, it's very possible. Mm. I mean, I mean, another example. I've got personal knowledge. I'm just down the road from here. Uh, mm. the, the Royal Arsenal, Woolwich. Um, when that was, when the Ministry of Defence moved out of there, um, a lot of the archive that was left in the offices there was only uh, only survived because people who worked there, who valued it, who knew how important it was, it was you know cr cutting edge scientific stuff like you know high speed photographs of. Um, uh, ammunition experiments and things like that right. scientifically really important stuff mm, mm. um was again being chucked right wow so things like blast wave analysis and all that kind of stuff it, all of that all of yeah. that yeah yeah oh, fascinating yeah um yeah well well thank you guys for watching um and we'll see you next time. I suppose one one thing I would say is just just to just to acknowledge and address, we did say in last in our last watching brief that we were going to be talking about uh, the one year anniversary of of war in Ukraine this week. Uh, I think things didn't quite come together, did they, Andy? For that, no. But I hope we will do in the near future. Yeah. Okay. But just wanted just to acknowledge that we we were going to and we and we haven't been able to this week. Uh, but until uh, our next watching brief, do take care. Do comment below if you have any interesting things to uh, to add. Messages uh, either via DMs or indeed in the email that you can see on the screen below. If you have a story or stories or a despicable uh, auction website that you want to bring to Andy's attention for punishment. And... <laughs> Don't um, <laughs> uh, And until next time, do take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>